Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, the Oland DH38. We check out that new specialized demo downhill bike. So many forks, including some cool prototypes. And finally, there's some European bike shows announced. Woohoo! So first up in news this week is a new fork from Oland, a new version of the DH38. So what's different with this fork? Well, starting with the air side, it now uses three chambers, which gives you basically loads of adjustment in terms of feel and ramp control. It's also really put an emphasis on reducing the breakaway forces needed to get that fork into its travel, new lubes, new greases, to make it a lot better in terms of small bump compliance. A new needle design to increase adjustability of low speed compression and rebound, and redesigned high and low speed compression. So loads going on. The cassette tool interface is also pretty cool, so similar to what you might have seen on the RockShox forks that remove any spanners needed to get anything out of the crowns, it's all done off the cassette tool, which is a really nice touch. Now this fork is actually pretty cool because it can go all the way down to 120 mil in terms of travel, so I wonder if this will open up some options for your enduro bikes. Now interestingly enough, we've also seen on Pink Bike over the weekend that there were sneak previews of that 1.8 inch steerer taper that Olin's were making a fork for on e-bikes. So maybe as mountain bikers, we're gonna have to come to a crossroads. Do we choose a new head tube standard or do we choose using some triple clamps on our hard hitting enduro and e-bikes? So um, yeah, it could get some people pretty riled up. So in terms of compatible tire sizes, in 29, it goes up to 2.8 inches, which is pretty big. And on 27.5, it goes up to a whopping three inches. So it also uses a floating axle, again, to help increase small bump sensitivity. And I think it's really worth noting that over the last, however long, couple of decades, there's been a real dominance in Fox and RockShox in terms of the World Cup anyway. But last season was the first season that I can think of where neither Fox or RockShox claimed an elite title. Lloyd Bruni, on the Olins and Tracy Hanna running a mix of Suntour and fast suspension. So I think that's pretty cool. The RRP of these forks starts at $1,600 or that's £1,250 for the fork or you can buy just the crown separately for $350. So yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. And this week we've seen a whole host of prototype forks floating about. So we've seen some more contraptions from Milliard and they say, I mean, they're a real big fan. They're really happy with the direction the fork's taking because they wanted the fork to match that hyper ride rear shock that we featured on the show previously. And just looking at the way it kind of handles the bumps on their Instagram page is pretty amazing. Just hitting a curb and it just tracks the ground like nobody's business. Also coming out of Italy, EXT, who were kind of coming out of the rally scene and make some incredibly boutique shocks, but they're getting more and more popular have seen on Mojo's Instagram page running some prototype forks. So this is really interesting. I hope to catch up with Chris Porter this week to get some more info on the forks for next week. But I'm really excited. They're doing some really interesting things. Basically using the, the kind of internal architecture of the rear shocks, they can, they can make it so the compression is actually progressive. Now what that means is, well normally when you have a damper, no matter where you are in the stroke, the damper is linear. It's actually all the compression and all the ramp up is done via the air side. Now that isn't so much of a problem in terms of our forks, but on our rear shocks, we want to fit coil, coil shocks to bikes that might be better suited and they need that ramp up of air. It, it kind of can run out of options with coil. So with progressive damping, it gives you so many more options so you can get that incredible small bump compliance of coil, but without banging through the travel. So it'll be really interesting to see what they have going on inside the damper on that EXT fork. Hopefully we'll get some more details next week. Okay, next up in news is the brand new specialized demo downhill bike, which has the ability to run mixed wheel sizes in that kind of mullet setup, the big wheel on the front and the smaller wheel on the back. Now we've obviously seen Loic Bruni have a very successful time developing and racing that bike. Now here it is on screen, the production version. It's available in three different options, the race, the race frame set and the expert. The race in the UK retails for just under 7,000 pounds, the frame set 3,000 pounds, 
and the Expert at £5,000. So you can expect fairly similar prices in euros. Now, the cool thing about this is it can still run both 27.5 and 29 inch wheels through changing the geometry of the back end of that bike. In the 27.5 setting, in the short setting, it's dedicated for the 27.5 inch wheel. So you can get the maximum agility from that. In the medium setting, you can both run 27.5 inch wheels or the 29. It feels like a longer back end with a 27 and a half, so you get a bit more stability for high speed courses. Uh, that will suit you if you want to stick with that kind of mullet setup on the bike, but you want a bit more stability. Or if you want a playful feel and you want to run the 29 inch wheel on the back as well as on the front, you put it in that mid setting. If you want a bit more stability from the bigger size wheel, you go for the long setting. The fact you've got three options there and two different wheel sizes that you can run makes this a really strong contender, not only for racers and privateer racers, but for people who just want to have fun on big bikes. I think with enduro bikes and trail bikes being so good, people kind of forget how much fun a downhill bike is. I mean, I've not really spent any time on one the last few years, and uh, I've got to say, looking at this thing, it's given me the itch to uh, get back on one, because they do look really good fun, don't they? Now, in addition to the fact that you can run those three different settings and the two different wheel sizes on the back end of the bike, it's had some changes to the suspension, the suspension curve, the amount of anti-squat and anti-rise on it. In particular, it's got quite a significant amount of anti-squat on it that's really going to help when you need to put a power down, which of course, that is what the racers need to do. There's no point just having a bike that's super plush, you've got to be able to get the thing to move forwards. And speaking of which, the axle path has changed significantly on it. It's quite a lot more rearward, at least for the beginning portion of that travel. And the idea with that is that it's not going to get stalled on those basically squarish bumps, the sort of stuff that makes a bike feel like it temporarily pauses and then lurches forward again. It's a very specific feeling if you've ever had a bike that doesn't have any sort of rearward feeling when you hit those square edge hits. It does feel like your bike is microscopically just stopping for a second. Of course, it doesn't actually work like that, but it all translates to forward propulsion. And of course, if a bike has got a slightly rearward axle path, the wheel's gonna be able to move up and around that obstacle. So if it helps you go faster forwards, it's gotta be a good thing. And looking at the results this frame has already had, I'd say it works pretty well. Okay, next up in news is the brand new version of the Cane Creek Helm Fork. Now, I actually discussed that fork on the Ask Show earlier in the week, so if you want to see that, there's going to be a link to it uh, in the description underneath this video. But the Helm is one of the most adjustable and complete forks that you can buy. Now, they're available in 27.5 and 29 inch models. They're available with a single offset, I think it's 44mm for the 27.5 and 44 and 51 for the 29. Now the cool thing about these forks are you can get them in air and coil, but with the air fork, you can adjust the air volume without needing air volume spacers. They've got a system built into the top cap that you can just adjust. So you don't need any spare parts and it means that you're free to just tweak that until your heart is content. The other cool thing is you can adjust the travel without having to change the air shaft on the forks. Now, in the older days, you could change the fork travel by doing similar things on various different forks. But as they've changed the, the way the internals of forks work, uh, be it on the damper side or on the air leg side, it's not possible on a lot of brand forks now. You have to actually change the air shaft itself for a longer or shorter one, depending which way you want to go. Not with the Cane Creek though. You can adjust it internally, which is fantastic. The new version comes in gloss black and matte black, depending on which wheel size you opt for or if you're quick off the mark, there are 50 sets worldwide of this hot pink edition. How good is that? I tell you, that thing looks unreal. I'd love to have a set of those on a bike because they should look rowdy. So on the new fork, the things that do differ from the older one, which was already amazing, um, and don't be concerned if you've got the old one because it's still an amazing fork, on the new one, it has a lower friction SKF oil head seal and lower friction SKF seals on there. It also has a larger volume air spring, uh, well, the air piston design on the inside there. So slightly more efficient than the last one, but not necessarily much better. It's just an improvement. That's how they, it's marginal gains the whole time. Now, just like the old one, it's got adjustable high and low speed compression, uh, also got adjustable rebound on there, and it's got their unique D-lock axle, which is immensely stiff. A very cool system, and there's a few more shots of the fork on screen. Now it's got 35 mil stanchions and the weight of the fork for the air fork is uh, 2,080 uh, 2, grams and for the coil version 2,340 grams. Um, there you go, an amazing set of forks from Cane Creek, definitely worth checking out if you've not already looked at them. 
Unquestionably, this has been one of the hardest years for cycling. Uh, the lack of cycling racing and events going on all around the world have made things really quite difficult. Um, we were really looking forward to all of the events earlier in the year, like the Sea Otter in Girona and Sea Otter in Monterey, California, but they were unfortunately postponed. But thankfully, things have started popping back in Canada. Now, Seattle in Girona is back, and the dates for that are 25th to the 27th of September. It's a brilliant event for demoing new bikes, and we know that Canyon are gonna be there with their new e-bikes, for example, but there's gonna be a lot of different brands there. You can go along, try them out, and they're still figuring out the logistics of making the event completely safe, but I think it's far enough ahead now that we can actually start planning for these things. Um, I'm gonna be there what an event it was last time I went last year. Uh, it was super hot, so actually it might be slightly better for me being a Brit, we're not very good in the heat. Uh, and also, it's really good to see Eurobike as well, because there's such demand for Eurobike, they didn't want to cancel it, so they've moved that back till November. So you're talking 24th to 26th of November, that's gonna happen at Friedrichshafen. Of course, Eurobike is one of the biggest shows of the lot. Now, it's a really important show. A lot of business takes place there. It is predominantly a trade show, but it means we're gonna to get to travel there, hopefully, and see all of that latest tech that we've missed out on this year. I'm really excited about this, and I really, really do hope that it's possible and it does, does happen, because uh, I think we all need a break, don't we? And we all wanna see the new stuff, hey? Now, last on the news, well, it's kind of a half piece of news. Our GMBN Tech Show always goes out on a Wednesday. However, there is a very exciting new piece of mountain bike tech being released tomorrow on Thursday. So I'm tight-lipped to the details now. However, if you follow our Instagram account, we will cover the breaking news as it happens and you won't miss out on a thing. So keep your eyes peeled tomorrow over on Instagram. So now it is time for the quiz. So I'm gonna read out the questions and you're gonna to have to tune back in with Doddy later on to get the answers. So the first question. The Cannondale Lefty Fork is famous for having a single leg, but what technology does it use to get around all of that flex and torsional twist? So a bit of a techie question there, but I no doubt some of you will know it. The second question. 510, originally known as 510 cut their teeth in other sports long before mountain biking, most notably climbing shoes. But which cycle manufacturer helped develop their first product on the mountain biking scene back in 2000? So which big mountain bike manufacturer helped make the first 510 flat pedal shoes? And the third question, BMC is a very famous Swiss bicycle manufacturer. Mountain bikes, road bikes, they make them all. But what does BMC stand for? So those are the questions, guys. You have to tune in later on to get the answers. And now it is time for Bike Cave. Now Bike Cave is the part of the show where we get to see some of the amazing creations people have installed in their homes to work on, to look after, to store their bikes. Now this week is a bit different as we have somebody that you might just have heard of. However, if you have your own bike cave, get it into the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Now, over the past however long it's been of this lockdown, one of my favorite things to do has been to check out Blake's bike cave as he builds it, goes out I think every Saturday morning on Blake Builds on GMBN main channel and it is absolutely fantastic. Now here are some pictures of Blake's Instagram and I'm in this bike cave. Honestly, when he said he was gonna do it, he's a, he's a, he's a pretty, you know, smart guy. I'm sure he's gonna work it out, but I didn't expect it to be this bloody good, <laughs> to be honest with you. He's got it lit up like a nightclub, it looks great. And even the, those Abus wall mounts, uh, sorry, the, the ground anchors. I mean, so neat, it looks absolutely fantastic. And massive kudos to Blake, because not only has he built something really cool, but he also designed it. And the difficult part is making sure the end build looks like the design, and it does. So I think absolute mega kudos to him. And um, if you haven't checked it out, yeah, start with episode one, get a good strong cup of tea and just watch it unfold. It's absolutely fantastic. And Blake's enthusiasm is infectious. It makes me think, oh my God, I can do anything. And I want to build an incredible bike cave like this. So um, absolute fair play to Blake. And um, yeah, get over onto the main channel to check that out. 
Hey Dottie, hey Henry, yes, thank you very much. Episode five is live on GMBN of Blake Builds Bike Cave. We've come so far and five is all about bike storage. Just like this with these toe peaks swing up. Bikes all here and I've got helmet storage and all of this right here is in episode six coming up very soon. Actually, Saturday, it'll be going live. It's all about this and my worktop and a few other bits and bobs. I even made this. All coming up. Okay, now it's time for Rewind, which of course is our retro part of the show. Get to talk about old mountain bike stuff. Now, if you've got anything old or you want to know anything, uh, let us know in the comments. Use that hashtag Rewind, or alternatively, the link to our uploader is right here where my finger is on the screen, and there's also a direct link to it in the description underneath this video. So if you want to contribute to this section of the show, please get involved. We love seeing what you've got. No matter how old it is, in fact, the older it is, the probably the better it is and more likely we are to feature it. Now, I have a bunch of old stuff here. I just want to say thank you to Rory Hitchens for sending this stuff in because it's taken me on a little nostalgic trip here and I've contacted some people I haven't been in touch with for a while. Now, this is one of the very early crud catchers that came about on the market. Now, of course, this is a down tube mounted mudguard. We'll look at the details of this in a minute, but it actually leads me on to the story of how it happened. Now, Rory Hitchens was on the Diamondback racing team at the time. And one of the racers on the team, in fact, he was in the vets class back then, sorry Pete, but I did have to say this, was Pete Tompkins. Now, Pete is a bit of an innovator, and if you meet the guy, he likes finding solutions to anything. And the riders were fed up with getting mud in their faces on British races, essentially. And they were all cutting down drinks bottles and basically zip tying or cable tying them onto the down tubes of their really nice bikes. Um, and they all got fed up with how bad they looked. So Pete was like, we can do better than this. So he prototyped a clip-on version and uh, got, it, got it to all the guys, including Roy, to try it. And they were like, why, why has no one done this sooner? This is a much better approach and we don't mind paying for it because we've got these really nice bikes and we want something to reflect that. So Pete, who was a painter and decorator at the time, took the plunge and got a whacking great loan out so he could basically buy the tooling in order to make the polypropylene mudguards. Now at the time, this was a lot of money and it was a big risk, but it certainly did pay off for Pete. So having had the tooling made to make the first crud catchers, Pete went and made thousands of the things and he filled up two bike boxes, I think he had about 500 of them, and he headed out to the World Championships in 1992, which was at Bromont. Now, I'm gonna be speaking about this World Championships in another video soon because a very significant thing with a very significant bike of which I have one parked over there um, happened, but we'll come back to that. The really cool thing that happened here was he went around all the pits giving out mud guards to all the team racers and basically sold any to other vendors that he could. Now, the coolest thing was Julie Furtado was racing at the downhill uh, this weekend. She actually raced on the GT RTS, which was the first time she'd ridden the bike. She had a crud catcher on her bike and she won the World Championships. First time she'd ridden a bike and she had a crud catcher. Now straight away that was amazing publicity for Pete, but the really cool thing was GT actually took the bike with mud on it as it was and they toured it around the USA and took it to loads of dealers, giving Pete basically the leg up uh, that he really needed. The visibility and everyone suddenly wanted crud catchers. And then Pete wasn't Pete the Painter anymore, it was Mr. Crud, um, as we all know. And now uh, Mr. Crud, you might, you might recognize this logo, he made loads of other products over the years, a DCD, various different models of mudguard, and they all started really with this, which is kind of cool actually. Uh, you can see the down tube mount here, kind of quite a crude design which is riveted on, but it's still got mud probably from the 90s. Knowing Rory, he won't have actually cleaned this, but I love the fact that I've got this here. Now on screen you can see a prototype, a wooden prototype of the next version because the first one, it was only in production for about four months. Um, he quickly realized they needed a better looking one to suit bikes and that's when the whole Star Wars style font came in. Um, and this is it, far cleaner looking and it was so good that even brands like Pace and Orange started including bosses on their down tube to mount the crud catchers directly on. Of course, as things started developing over the years, he had more features. This one's got a rubber deformable nose. As suspension forks, the crown started getting bigger and wider. As you're turning, as you would actually move your crud catcher out of the way. So by having a deformable nose on the front there, he got around that. And he kept on developing stuff all the way through until the modern day stuff. So the new Crud XL, this is one on a nuke proof bike I was riding last winter that I actually ran. This was a 27 and a half inch bike, but I ran a short travel fork and a 29 inch front wheel just to try that mullet thing on it. 
Um, the cool thing about this, Danny Hart's actually used one of these, and he's been using it for, I think, nearly two years now. Amazing mud guard. The fact it doesn't use cable tires, it uses rubber O-rings to mount it. So everyone's got a few of those hanging around, and Pete had a load hanging around anyway. So he thought, well, we can reuse these. So not only is that a great use of reusing rubber O-rings, but it means it's not gonna scratch your bike like cable tires can. And also, the really cool thing about it is the fact you can run it nice and low to catch spray coming off the front wheels. So if you're riding in somewhere really wet with a fine mud, or if like us, you're riding in big, thick, horrible mud, you can run it quite high. So it won't clog, but you're still gonna keep the mud off your goggles when you're riding and racing. Really cool that he's progressed through all the years and he's still doing stuff. And the coolest thing about Pete, you won't mind me saying this, he's a gnarly old dude. He is out on his bike every day. It's ridiculous. He's still shredding now. I think he's discovered e-bikes now. But I'm just gonna throw you back to a couple of original shots. This is one of Pete on screen here. Uh, note the paint all over his trousers. He'd finished painting and decorating and headed out on his bike. And I think this one he said was um, 1972. A group of us used to go out every evening after work. Uh-huh, that's paint all over my jeans. Uh, I love the story, I think it's really cool. Um, if you want to see the video where Julie Furtado raced uh, the GT RTS with a crud catcher on, there's going to be a link to that in the description under here. That's part of the excellent series from GT Bikes. Uh, if you like the crud catcher stuff, by the way, um, there's also a t-shirt out by our friends at Bike Ninja who do all the retro stuff. Uh, wicked to see that, I love the old Star Wars font on there. But um, it's just ace. I love the fact the bike scene's got all this sort of stuff now. It's old enough that we've got a bit of a history. And um, yeah, well, the crud catcher is definitely part of that. So cheers, Pete. And now it is time for Top Mod. So if you've got your own Top Mod, get it in the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it. Now this week has actually got two ends of the spectrum, but I think they're both fantastic. So the first submission is something, well, it's very, very easy to do. It's from Thomas and he's basically showing what happens when sadly, you forget to put that retaining bolt in your brake caliper, you put on the brakes and your pads whoosh, go bye-bye. Now this is very easy to do. And dare I say it, we were on a ride last summer on a nice afternoon, all the channel was out, all the presenters were there and I'm not naming any names, but this happened to all the presenters and we had to get a little bit of a wiring from a fence, jam it in there, but it did the job after a bit of rattling around. And basically, it shows how important that little retaining clip is there. Now, Thomas went for some fine, some fine wood there, a bit of um, give it more of a sort of a bohemian feel, but you can use anything really. And, you know, you can, if you do lose that bolt, you can get those, um, those kind of split pins, which are really, really good because, yeah, you're, what, what can be worse is actually if you keep pumping the brake and then the piston comes out and then it is just good night, sweetheart. So um, a really cool job, uh, bodge from Thomas. And, you know, Top Mods, we show some really refined pieces of kit, which is like this next one from Hayden. But I love seeing the bodges. They're kind of when you just, just got away from it by your absolute skinnier teeth. So um, if you do have one of those ones, don't be shy on getting it in, because, well, it always makes me smile. But onto the other end of the spectrum, onto Hayden from Brisbane, and this is, Something really cool. So the Nuke Proof Snap is kind of a bit of, well, a, bit of a fan favourite from back in the day. Four cross, all that sort of thing, probably. I don't know, a couple of years old now, but really, really sought after bike. And um, he is, I mean, we've done a lot of these recently, but he's just made a really nice job of it. Taking the paint off, fresh liquor paint, and I mean, look at it. And the tan walls just look fantastic. Now, interestingly enough, I'm presuming because of the, the, um, the vertical dropouts on the back there, he's having to use a chain device as to get some tension in the chain. But that is such a good workaround because it's also gonna give it a bit of protection, I would assume. So I think that's really, really cool. The paint job is absolutely immaculate and the decals look absolutely great. Now, this is also my time, a bit of a call for help really. So I, next week, am gonna be stripping back the paint off an aluminum frame and try and get it as good as I can now, I want it to be absolutely showroom condition, but I might have to, you know, adjust my expectations as we go. But what kit do I need? What, you know, do you use anything in terms of getting that high, pristine finish? Are you using any drill bits? Do you use something on a bench? Let us know in the comments. I'm gonna read everything, and I'm gonna soak it all in like a sponge as I try and find out what kit I need, what's the best way to do it, if you've done it yourself, what 
experience would you pass on? Because there's bound to be some and I want it to come out looking absolutely fantastic. So the pressure's on, but any tips and tricks, get in the comments, let me know. And honestly, I'll read every single one. So thank you very much. Okay, now it's quiz time. Time for the answers. Did you get them right? Right, so we're gonna hit you up with the three answers to the questions Henry asked earlier in the show. So the first question was in relation to that single-legged Cannondale lefty. He said, Cannondale lefty is famous for having a single leg. Do you know how they get around the lower rotating? If you think about it, it's a single leg fork, so what's to stop the fork moving around? Any ideas? Well, the cool thing about the lefty is it actually has a square stanchion. And on that square stanchion, it has obviously four faces. You think instead of having two round tubes that can rotate around each other, it's got a round tube and it's got rows of needle bearings. I think it was 88 on each row uh, on the inside that sat on those, uh, those flat faces that basically got it around moving. And upside to that was there was almost zero stiction. So the way that you had to set the fork up was very different. And also the fork was incredibly active and still is incredibly active in turns because of this design, because there's no binding. Binding is when the fork twists very slightly under compression, uh, something you wouldn't get when the fork's being loaded in a turn. And as you get binding, of course, the compression of the fork is affected slightly. Now the lefty is something that just doesn't suffer from that. So a really cool design. Although the latest version of the fork, the Ocho, which is the single crown option, to remove a lot more weight from the fork and improve the design. It still uses the needle bearings, but it has three surfaces. So very much like a pyramid, uh, but that's how they get around the fork rotating. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, next question was about 510. So 510, originally named 510E, which I didn't know, they cut their teeth in other sports long before mountain biking. But when they did come into mountain biking, who did they collaborate with? Any ideas? Yep, it was Intense Bikes. Now, Jeff Steber from Intense, I mean, the guy is like a natural born tinkerer. He can't, he just can't help himself. If he sees something that's good, he's got to find a way of making it better or using it for a different application. He's still doing prototypes of bikes constantly in their Temecula headquarters. Now, he was aware of the 510 climbing shoe rubber, which was known as Stealth Sticky Rubber, and it was unlike other rubber available to put on footwear. He was also aware of how popular flat pedals were, but there was nothing resembling a good enough shoe to really stick to the pedal. So he pretty much did a cut and shut by skimming off the sole. And I think he basically laminated or glued it onto a set of skate shoes and the idea was born. And then he did the first collaboration with 510. And in fact, the intense shoes looked pretty cool. They're a bit clumpy at the time, but actually if you look back in retrospect, they kind of remind me of some of the, like the Adidas like free trail sort of type shoes that you can get at the moment, which is ironic because of the collaboration that, that's happened now with 510 and Adidas. But um, yeah, it was intense that did it first before 510 actually branched out themselves into the scene. I wonder how Jeff feels about that because really Jeff was first, so he deserves the props. And next up, and this is a really cool one, I 100% didn't know this, what does BMC stand for? Now I've heard someone out there, a friend of mine say, bicycle marriage counseling, but it's not that. Bicycle manufacturing company. Isn't that mad that it's, it's that obvious? You know, just like Rocky Mountain having bikes.com as their web, web name, bicycle manufacturing company. How has no one else picked up on that? But there you go. Um, did you get any answers right there? How'd you do? Let us know in the comments underneath. And that is it for another weekly GMBN tech show. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And guys, get in the comments. What do you think? Do you, would you rather see another headset standard going to a larger taper or moving towards those kind of downhill dual crown triple clamp forks? What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing and we'll see you next time.